It gives me a great pleasure to be here today for a number of reasons. Uh, certainly, this topic is one near and dear to my heart. Um, it's an academic topic that I have worked on for many years. Today, what I thought I would do uh, is give you kind of a global perspective, first of all, on connectivity and access to the internet, and then try to break it down with a slice of life by region for you, so that you can see, as we look at the challenges today, where the access and connectivity issues might be. So I thought I would, I thought I would start with the global baseline. Uh, as many of you know, probably Gallup does world polling on uh, almost every issue under the sun, and certainly they've done it on access and connectivity. So this is the global baseline. You can see uh, that you have about 68% of the global population that, is, that has access at some point uh, during the course of, of a 30-day period. Um, and if you look at that and compare it with the world population estimates right now at 7.9 billion, then you know there's still half the world's population that is not connected in some way. Next uh, slide, please. Um, I'm going to break this down uh, by world regions and sub-regions. I'm going to start first with the European Union so you can look at the aggregate, and then I'll show you the by-country view as well for the, the European Union. In this particular survey, uh, 26 of the 27 current EU countries were polled. So next slide, please. Uh, so you see the, the high percentage there of those who are connected and the small percentage who are not. And we'll get to why, what makes up that small percentage, particularly in terms of gender, age, uh, and certainly uh, ethnicity in, in many cases. Next slide, please, for the country breakdown. This shows you the country breakdown uh, in the European Union with Finland, of course, and the other Scandinavian countries being at the highest. And then, of course, uh, at the lowest you have, which is still a high figure, you have Cyprus at 86%. Next slide, please. The United States, I thought I would stick us in here as well for a number of reasons. Uh, we have uh, a high internet access but it's uneven. Uh, certainly the highest access tends to be in the Pacific Northwest, the Northeast right here in the DMV area, we're at about 64%. And then, uh, of course, we have challenges in urban centers, we have challenges in certain states. Uh, certainly we have about six southern states that fall below 50%, uh, and that also includes uh, West, West Virginia falling below um, uh, 50% in terms of people having access to the internet. the internet. Next slide, Latin America and the Caribbean. It's the aggregate slide of the 18 countries polled. You'll see that 79%, uh, there's a 79% access and connectivity and a 20% of the population that does not have that. I will get to you know, why that is uh, toward the end of the presentation. Uh, I hope I get some of my minutes back. Uh, Latin America, this is the by country view. Please go to the next slide. And you'll see there with uh, Uruguay, uh, who would have guessed it at the highest percentage at 89%, and then Nicaragua uh, at the lowest percent at 52%. So there's a range there. The next is the MENA region, and we include that Middle East and North Africa. This is the aggregate view, please, for the next slide. Yes, perfect. Uh, there you have 71% and you have 70 and 28% that don't have access. I also want you to keep in mind as I'm showing you these slides that there is a difference between access, connectivity, and freedom of use. So as you think about all of these issues uh, and all of these graphics, keep that in mind. Uh, next slide is the by country slide for the MENA region. There are 13 countries that were polled here. And Gallup actually does um, actual interviews. It's not an electronic survey. It's really going and talking to individuals uh, on a person-by-person -person basis, so they're actual interviews. Saudi Arabia at 98%, Egypt at 42% on this particular uh, slide. And again, keep in mind, access does not mean freedom of use uh, for, for a lot of countries. The next region is Asia Pacific. This is the aggregate view. It should be on that next slide for the aggregate view for the Asia Pacific. Uh, 63% uh, access. 37% say no. The Asia Pacific region includes about 23 countries, which you'll see on the next slide. Please go to the next slide, perfect. 
Uh, New Zealand, of course, uh, at high, the highest level at 95 percent, and Afghanistan, uh, no surprise to all of us, probably at 14 percent with the least. Next, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, in the Sub-Saharan Africa region, 23 countries were polled. Uh, I wanted first to show you the aggregate view. Uh, you see the, the disparity there in terms of connectivity and access. You have 61 percent saying no. Within the last 30 days, they have not had any access to, in to Internet. And then 39 percent saying yes. Uh, next slide. I wanted to give you the slice of life here um, with first starting with the gender issue. And this, this is just for one region, but take this as an example of uh, things happening in other regions. Females are the most uh, impacted about not having access or connectivity to the Internet on a daily basis. And so this shows you here on this particular slide, looking at the, the Sub-Saharan Africa here, that you have 66 percent, and the bulk of that um, uh, you know, demonstrates you know, across countries how women and girls do not have regular access to, to the Internet. Uh, the next slide is the by country slide, and you will see um, Mauritius has the highest and Tanzania has the lowest. I thought I would do an additional breakdown of some of the countries that are considered engines of growth for their subregions, and that would be uh, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. Please go to the next slide. And you'll see there, I wanted this in particular because the, you'll see here that even though these are the engine of growth subregion countries, uh, they still have a challenge with connectivity and access. Uh, on a daily basis. And so despite having a, a high uh, economic framework, they still have challenges with access and connectivity. Um, I also thought that it would be interesting to, to look at how these countries operated over the last 30 days. And certainly South Africa, even though it has one of the highest unemployment rates uh, on the subcontinent, uh, it still has a, a greater uh, access to Internet than uh, most of the other sub-Saharan African countries. I also wanted to compare for you, you know, taking into account the economic framework that I'm talking, these are the, considered the highest engines of growth. Uh, look where women fall in terms of not having access to the Internet. You have 72 percent um, in Nigeria, 51 percent in Kenya, and 34 percent in South Africa. So it's still a challenge. This next slide is one that I thought would, might be of interest to this audience. Uh, it's the Internet access on the BRICS countries. And again, this is a slice of life I'm trying to share with you. The BRICS countries, for those that don't know, um, is a grouping that started 14 years ago that includes Brazil, Russia, India, China, and China. And the S is for South Africa, but it really does include the broader Sub-Saharan Africa region. And I wanted to do this comparison because there is a big push by India, China, Russia uh, to, to uh, address the connectivity issue on the continent. So I thought I would give you a, a picture of what that looks like uh, and what it looks like in their own countries, uh, and it impacts how they are, are operating on the, on the sub-Saharan African continent as well. The next slide. Yes. I thought I would share with you a couple of the experiential things that uh, I have come across working on the ground. I've mentioned some of them already as challenges to connectivity and access. Uh, I talked about gender. Age is definitely at the top of the list. Whether you live in an urban or rural environment, what region in a particular country you live in. I already gave the, region, the, the example here in the United States that in the southern part of the United States, we have least access there. Uh, we also know by ethnic group and language. Uh, most of the internet, you know, are, are tr is translated into the major primary languages. So what happens if you don't speak one of those? Are, you're excluded. So when you look at connectivity and access, you've got to take that into account. You have to take education into account. And you also have to take type of device into account. Uh, because in a lot of rural areas in the developing world, they're still using feature phones, which are not smartphones. And they don't have the full capability that we are used to here in the United States. Infrastructure. Uh, I mentioned this because I think that when we talk about access and connectivity, we're missing the ecosystem of 
the infrastructure. What else is missing? It's not just about how do you connect somebody by fiber optics to get, be able to, or by phone to be able to use the, uh, the internet, but what are the infrastructure things that need to be in place? Certainly, you have a challenge with the distance between cell towers. That means you can have great gaps in your ability to connect. Uh, in addition, uh, you have uh, you know, challenges that are happening uh, between the great powers, the U.S. and China in particular on the continent, so you have this debate between who, what 5G are you going to use, and that impacts your access. And then I guess the most important thing uh, that I worked on over the years is the power challenges. If you have inconsistent power, whether it's traditional or renewable, how are you going to keep your phone charged? if you don't even have electricity. You have about 600 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa that do not have electricity on a daily basis. So when you're talking about access and connectivity, you have to keep these other things in mind. And then there's the affordability. Do you debate between buying a credit for your phone or buying bread for your children? You don't want anybody to have that debate, and that debate is going on all across the developed regions. And lastly, um, the new approaches. I'm just going to touch a little bit since I'm um, almost out of time here. The two things I want you to take away, if you, can, if you can from this slide, is that we've got to pay attention to how people get connected to the Internet, particularly in rural areas. Satellites are a way to think about it. We don't really think about satellites as much as we think about cell tower and we think about fiber optics. Equity inclusion I already mentioned. And the two great examples that I see on connectivity uh, are really being created in the developing world. One is called BRICS, without a, uh, the IC in it, but pronounced BRICS, just like a regular brick, shaped like a brick. Uh, it does a couple of things. It has a battery pack, so you can connect through the BRICS entity, which is about the size of a brick. Connect to that. If you, have, if you get a drop in power, then there's eight hours of power on that BRICS, so it functions like a cell tower, but it's not and it connects to the satellite um, so that you don't have to connect to a cell tower. Uh, I've been following BRICS since 2013, wrote my first article about them, and they have now morphed into several other types of connectivity. And then um, lastly is how do you get there? What are the public-private partnerships that you get there? I add another P to that because I think that municipalities also have to work together and share resources. And so I call it my 4P model. Uh, I discuss it in my book that talks about uh, this transformation, this leapfrogging that the developing world has to do in order to have access and connectivity. Thank you.